Good evening, assalamu alaikum. Thank you for joining us for this uh, webinar, live webinar today with our area imams and health professionals to discuss and also answer your questions around COVID vaccinations, as well as the upcoming holy month of Ramadan. Um, I would like to begin introducing our panelists. On my screen first, we have Dr. Tanvir, who's an infectious disease specialist in the Salt Lake area, affiliated with many hospitals. Um, on my screen on the right side is Imam Yasir Bhatt. He is the Imam at um, Islamic Society of Greater Salt Lake, which operates two mosques, Khadija and Noor. And then we have Imam Tijar, who is with the Islamic um, uh, Center of Kuwait up in Ogden. Then I have Wagma Moman, who is a physician assistant and practices at Redwood Clinic. Dr. Suhail Khan is a brilliant cardiologist. He has been looking at uh, COVID uh, from patient care angles. And then we have Leila Ramich, who is a registered nurse. We're also very lucky to have Imam Yusuf join us actually from Kenya live where he's visiting his family. Um, I would like to begin our uh, webinar by asking Imam Yasser if he could uh, speak about the understanding uh, in terms of faith as to how do we view the vaccinations and our faith and what his opinion is about vaccination during Ramadan. Imam Yusuf, your uh, is Imam Yasser, you're muted. Yeah, Salam alaikum wa rahmatullah. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala ali Sayyidina Muhammadin wa barik wa sallam. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah. We seek and we send praises and thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his immense bounties. And we send salutations on our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us guidelines of uh, keeping the balance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Rahman, he says, Allah tatlu fil mizan. That do not uh, tilt the balance uh, in your life, in your body, in your soul, everywhere. And part of that achievement of balance is to balance uh, the priorities of healthcare and also looking at pandemics and these challenges that humanity faces. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he gave us very clear guidances or guidance on how to deal with a person who is infected. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a sahih hadith in Bukhari, he says, Fir min al majdhumi firaraka min al asad aw kama qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That if a person is majdhum, right, that he is basically uh, infected with any kind of communicable disease, then stay away from them. And he used the metaphor as run away from him as you run away from a lion because you want to save your life. As a matter of fact, a man was coming to Medina uh, to give the Prophet ﷺ allegiance. And he found out that the man was infective and had the plague. So he told an emissary to go tell the man halfway through his journey that we have accepted your allegiance. Don't need to come to Medina because that will cause a problem as far as a infection and, you know, like a start, start uh, infection there in Medina. And Rasulullah Sallallahu also told us, of course, based on the Qur'an, the Sunnah is the interpretation of the Qur'an, as is the Fiqh, which is the interpretation of the Sunnah. According to Imam Zarkashi, who is a great scholar of the Qur'an. Rasulullah Sallallahu says in a hadith, which is accurate, إِنَّ لِبَدَنَكِ عَلَيْكَ حَقًا That your body has a right on you. So these are called asbab. Asbab meaning, these are means. And we take all the asbab to cure ourselves and protect ourselves and keep ourselves healthy. Of course, as a religious person, we have to give a clear guidance and encouragement to the people to seek medical and professional advice, right? Because we're not doctors at the end of the day. We are people who are working with theology and sacred text. So the advice is always looking at the vaccine from an angle of permissibility, you know, ingredients, uh, is it allowed, not allowed, et cetera, et cetera, in terms of the ingredients. But as far as, uh, you know, precautions and as far as professional advice, 
we always encourage our community to talk to the doctors and take the necessary steps to uh, make their family safe and healthy and protect them from any possible exposure to any pathogen that can cause uh, you know, grief and of course disrupt lives as this has done. Thank you, Mom, for your benevolent explanation. I really appre appreciate it. Um, before I go to our next Imam, Imam Tijar, I do want to apologize that we spelled his name wrong on our flyer, um, and we're making the correction right now by acknowledging it. Imam, would you please tell us about the, pers pers the permission of getting COVID vaccine and other vaccines during uh, fasting? Alhamdulillahi wahda. Wassalatu wassalamu ala man la nabiyya ba'da. All the praise due to Allah alone and may the salah and salam be upon him whom there is no prophet after. First, I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for facilitating such a wonderful opportunity. Then I thank the Utah Muslim Civic League for doing such a great job in, in outreaching and helping the community and the society getting the vaccine that they need. Then I thank everybody who's involved, panelists, the noble panelists for taking time of their busy schedule to be here. And of course, all of the attendees, may Allah reward you tremendously. As for the permissibility of taking the COVID shot or the vaccine, as Imam Yasser has alluded to, it all has to do with what is in the ingredient of the vaccine itself. The scholars, there are four different types of vaccination out there in general. Uh, there is a vaccination, there is a vaccine. Well, first of all, is it permissible to take vaccine in general, as a general, without it specifying it? Um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a hadith that is narrated in the two Sahih al-Bukhari wa Muslim. He said, Man asbaha bi sab'ita marati adwin, lam yadurru thalika, lam yadurru thalika al-yawm summun wa la sahra. That whosoever takes early morning seven dates from the ajwa of Medina, then no magic or no disease or no poison could come up unto him. So here the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam alludes that that it is okay for us to go ahead and take prevention means in order for us not to go ahead and get sick. So the scholar from that have to do is that says it is permissible to take vaccine, but depending on the vaccine as Imam Yasser Habibullah has stated, if the ingredients of the vaccine is permissible, it is permissible for us to take, to consume, to sell, so on and so forth, and it does not cause any harm, then there is no question amongst the scholars that it is permissible to do so. Then there is another type of vaccine where in it, there is haram ingredients, not permissible, but unlawful ingredients. And uh, uh, for those ones, uh, it is not permissible to take. Now there are other ones that have haram ingredients, however, due to a chemical uh, uh, act action or to act or a chemical uh, uh, intervention, they have absolutely changed the structure of the vaccine from it being from a halal a haram substance to something completely different now. And if that's the call, the, the scholars of fiqh and jurisprudence, they call it istihala, i.e. it has changed it is origin from its original uh, uh, state. And the like of those, if the harm, if the, if the good outweighs the harm, it is also permissible to take. As for the last one is, is the one that the harm of it is not known. Yes, it is permissible, the ingredients of it, but the harm is not known. And uh, maybe the harm outweighs the good of it. This is not permissible to take. So these are the four different types of vaccines out there. So as for the COVID, we go ahead and take a look at it from the aspect of, is the ingredient of it halal? If so, absolutely it is permissible uh, to take because the scholars of medicine that we have over here and others, they may attest to it is uh, uh, effectiveness and, and due to the, also the harm, uh, the good outweighs the harm that may come out of it. So this is in a nutshell, 
um, answer and your question, and I hope that it was sufficient. And Allah knows best. Thank you, Imam. Uh, we do appreciate. Uh, my next question is to Wagma. Uh, knowing you personally, I know that you had to have tested positive for COVID-19 early in the pandemic, and you've also been fully vaccinated. You do work with uh, patients who are directly affected. I wanted to ask you if you, the symptoms that you felt with the uh, with COVID and the symptoms you felt after taking the vaccination, how do they differ? What has your experience been seeing patients and the after effects and the benefits that you feel uh, are available? Oh, thank you, Luna. Um, I, yes, I had COVID um, June of 2020 and I had a pretty bad case of it where I was uh, not working for about two and a half, almost three months. And I am also one of the long haulers, so I've had continuous symptoms afterwards too. And I would like to say that the, side, the minimal side effects that I did have from the vaccination was nothing compared to my actual COVID symptoms. And that's actually something that I tell my patients a lot because um, unfortunately, um, because of misinformation out there, um, the thought is if you're young, you'll just recover and there won't be any side effects or any long-term effects. And that's simply not the case. We're just learning more and more, even people who have mild, who have had mild cases of COVID um, have complications afterwards. And a lot of them are actually long haulers, even after having a mild acute phase of the disease. And so, um, I mean, in my clinic, I have seen um, a very young women who are having a lot of clots one month after having COVID. And, um, and then I'm seeing like type two diabetics in their 60s and 70s, and I'm completely worried that they're not going to do well and they surprisingly do well. So the nature of the virus is such that we don't know a lot about it, right? And it affects people very differently. And because it affects people differently, there's no guarantee that if someone is young, they will do well from the virus. There are definitely long-term effects and a lot of the patients that I've been seeing with these um, long COVID type of symptoms, a huge population has anxiety and anxiety that did not exist before. And you know, it's kind of hard to tell if the anxiety is because they're anxious about COVID itself and the trauma that they went through, but it seems like a lot of these people had absolutely no mental health illnesses beforehand and now they do and so we're just simply discovering a lot more you know other symptoms include shortness constant shortness of breath fatigue brain fog um, and joint pain and so what i like to tell my patients is that you know sure maybe you got go, you know you're over covid and you did well you just there's no guarantee that if someone gets covid a second time around if the severity of it will be you know mild or if it'll be worse or with the new variants we just don't know so i highly encourage people and my patients to um, take the vaccination because essentially the benefits of the vaccine definitely outweigh the risks and the harms of what COVID can cause. Um, and um, and there's and also it's you know it's so hard to tell if people of a certain age group or you know young people are prone to getting really sick too. So I think that's just a really good reminder and overall essentially like overall education about the disease itself really um, pushes people towards vaccination. Thank you, Wagma. And I think you've highlighted some of the themes that um, me as a lay person, when I'm interacting with a lot of folks, um, the idea of isolation, mental health, the way it's getting affected, the way kids are you know, out of school and not being able to socialize the way they used to. I think there's a secondary discussion to be had um, around these issues, but I uh, want to move on to Imam Youssef. And I know that you have enthusiastically taken the vaccination for yourself and have also encouraged your community, our community to take the vaccination. But the numbers that we see are pretty low. 
still uh, of folks who are taking the vaccination. I wanted to ask you if you have had any feedback from your community as to what is the hesitancy? What is uh, holding people back from taking this vaccination? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First of all, I will say salam all the imams and mashallah the doctors and sister Luna. You know, now it's 3 a.m. for me. It's 3 a.m. You know, in Kenya. And alhamdulillah, you know, the reason like I'm here tonight, this time, that I want to be involved in my community. You know, the Civic League, Alhamdulillah, I have so amazed the job they're doing. But Alhamdulillah, we have to sacrifice together, inshallah. Even if you wake up late in the night just to improve yourself and inshallah your community is, mashallah, it's very, very nice to do that, Alhamdulillah. And it will please by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the second thing, the question you ask me, yes, I, 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 you know, Alhamdulillah, you know, I was the one that I was among the uh, people like who were encouraging people to go out and take the vaccines. Even I did myself, alhamdulillah. And I still encourage our community to go out. But you know what happened? Like um, there's a lot of negativity out there that telling the people that, oh, you know, maybe you will be okay. But in the long run, you know, it's going to come after you, right? So that's one of the things that people are saying you know, one another, like, okay, if you go out and you take the vaccines, it's going to harm you, like, maybe even after one year or two years, or yeah, you don't feel now, you know, but you, it's going to harm you, that's one of them. Uh, but, you know, subhanAllah, the, the amazing thing is that I have my grandma with me, I, I, I took her from, from Utah, from US to Nairobi, Kenya, you know, she did her, you know, martial her vaccines, everything before she came here, and alhamdulillah, uh, amazing, you know, she's doing well, alhamdulillah. And nothing have any issue or any problem, mashallah, you know, she's with me in, in Nairobi. So the community, they need, you know, the leaders to stand up and to encourage. That's what they need. Because once we lead by example, when once we lead encouragements, once we send a lot of awareness, like now what Dr. Wagma, what she, what she said, it, it gives people motivation to go out and do that, you know. It brings people, alhamdulillah, to take the vaccines. So I will say that there's a negativity there, but we need to do more job, inshallah, and involve. Especially now Ramadan is coming. Some people, they were saying, oh, can I take the vaccines during Ramadan, the month of Ramadan? This is permissible in Islam. What Islam says about that? Oh, you know, if I cannot take during the day, can I take it during the night? Is there any, you know, hospital that gives during the night, you know, the, the vaccines? So they have asked all those questions, inshallah, I think, if the doctors they can answer but alhamdulillah then the community there's a negativity there you know like we need to but alhamdulillah encourage and talk to them that's what i will say but on that alhamdulillah everyone knows now the vaccines is open for everybody and they have to go out and take it and you know of course if they will not take it there's a time will come that people they will take it you know there's a time will come that people they will wish to, to go and take it uh, because they will require to travel, traveling, they will require for a lot of things going to come. So I think, inshallah, you know, the best time now is to encourage our community to tell them to go out and take the vaccines, inshallah. As the leaders also, we have to lead them by example, encourage them during our Jum'a time, you know, the khutbah, and also we have to educate, you know, I will request if, you know, Utah Muslim Civic League, if they will come, you know, sometimes to the the community center, inshallah, and then talk about the vaccines. That also will help, mashallah. Thank you so much, Sister Luna, and all the, the you know, Muslim Civic League. May Allah bless you, inshallah. I'm very happy to be with you tonight. Alhamdulillah. Thank you, Imam. I wanted to ask if you have heard from the community, if they have any problem or any barrier of making appointments for vaccines or going and getting it done, do you think fear is the only reason or is there also uh, structural issues of, you know, they don't know how to register or they don't have time to go get vaccines? Any uh, sort of uh, uh, ex uh, any feedback that you can share with us? So, um, you know what I know, Alhamdulillah, 
um, in, in our state, Utah, mashallah, even I was reading on the, you know, the news about the New York Times, they, they, they recorded like the Utah, but Alhamdulillah, the Masajid, and, you know, the Utah Muslims are doing a good job for, you know, encouraging, making the community easy to take the vaccines. So I think our community, Alhamdulillah, they get a lot of gen generosity from, from the health department, from the, you know, from the, from, 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 from Alhamdulillah, the Utah Muslims League, they have a lot of, you know, mashallah, uh, uh, you know, they have a lot of connection to go out and take the vaccines. But the only thing I will say, of course, maybe some people, they will, they don't know how to access, you know, the, the, the vaccines. Maybe, yes, I don't want to generalize, but I will say most of the people are fear. You know, they were, even Dr. Wagma, she knows that, you know, when I talk about our Somali community, you know, a lot of them, they're anti-vaccines, you know, right? Yeah, they will ask you questions. Even me and my wife, sometimes we have a lot of discussion about to get, you know, my kids to be vaccinated. Some of them even now still, they're on the waiting list, you know, take the vaccines. So I'm talking about not, not the COVID vaccines, but I'm talking about like not general vac the vaccines. So Alhamdulillah, but this is different, you know, people, they Thank have to understand that. It's not, yeah. Sister Luna. Okay. Um, okay. Before I okay. ask my next question uh, to, uh, to Suhail, I do want to come back. Are seeing any barriers for people to access the vaccination or do you also feel it's the fear factor that's holding them back? Who are you? Uh... Are you, were you, was that, to, I lost your voice. Was um, that toward me? Yes. Okay. You know, one thing we have to come to terms with as Muslims is that we live in a country that has stratified and diversified opinions. So even amongst Muslim scholarship, uh, there are, uh, of course, underlying tendencies to consider vaccines quote unquote, not allowed or haram. Uh, you know, I've personally uh, seen doc, uh, ulama who basically out of uh, long-term concerns, you know, and uh, ingredient misunderstanding, you know, they may consider the vaccines to be not allowed. So we should not put our head in the sand and act like, you know, we're an army of angels just like in the United States, one third of the military, you know, one third of the U.S. military uh, declined to take the vaccines. This is actually a fact from news. Uh, it's also a fact that every day since January of 2021, uh, you know, 120 research papers have been written about the virus because we do not know about it. And this is actually from Dr. Deepak Chopra uh, and other, uh, you know, very reputable places like PubMed and you know the national institutes of health and so forth so everybody's trying to understand the virus and every community is different so in the muslim community there is a tendency and there is a trend also just like in the christian community in the orthodox jewish community in the african-american community and all the other diasporas of uh, the united states that have a, a mistrust of the pharmaceutical companies they have a distrust of uh, government, they have a distrust of anybody who tries to push things on them, right? So we have to understand that we are dealing with that phenomena, right? But our our best guess and is to to, for instance, engage them in dialogue. I'm a person who has a very um, you know deep uh, background in clinical research and drug development. I've done that before I became an imam for a very long time. So I basically take them to a task. I say, I tell them, like Imam Tijar was saying, that there's a, there's a process of chemical transformation, which he referred to as istihala. That, okay, if let's say if one of these vaccines had a fetal aborted cell line that you are concerned about that is najis and it's impure and you can't inject it. Well, is it the same right now or is it the same like it was in the 1960s and the 70s, right? And all these other discussions. So I think... I have taken a position that I like to educate and inspire and help them reach the decision rather than me basically for forcing them 
and holding their hand and pulling them in a direction. You see what I'm saying? So we have in our community just the same challenges that every other community has, mm -hmm. which is the African American community. <laughs> and this this uh, pandemic is very unique. Because like uh, Dr. Wagba and Dr. Sahil were are also discussing, and I think Dr. Uh, Tanvir also knows that there are, um, uh, if a person gets sick, uh, it's a very, uh, the, the prognosis is not very uh, predictable. The prognosis of the disease, which means the outcomes in, in medical terms is not very predictable. And a person may become totally incapacitated or a person may be basically the next day go to the gym and be fine, right? So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Uh, Imam Tijar, what do you see in your community? Um, are people afraid or is it hard to get themselves scheduled for vaccinations? Uh, I wish it was the latter one. Uh, actually, there is some fear. There is no doubt about it. There is some fear. There is a lot out there that will go ahead and uh, pull you in so, so, in so many different directions. Um, there, are, there are those uh, conspiracy theorists out there that they keep you know, uh, uh, propagating their, their uh, theories out there. And uh, uh, unfortunately, we grasp onto these and hold form onto them stronger than facts. Uh, and this is, this is common, this is, this is how we are, unfortunately. This is how we are. Uh, so yes, there is a lot of fear out there. As a matter of fact, yesterday I was talking to somebody that I was trying to get them to uh, register for our clinic that we're gonna be hosting uh, this Saturday. And uh, uh, him and his family are refusing because they have heard from somebody, from some doctor somewhere that it is, uh, going to be a danger later on down the hall and he refused and uh, and it is uh, there are there are those people who are out there that are propagating the like of these things and and to be honest with you it is it's a new thing right it's not i mean covid is like a year old and we have these new vaccines we have so so we understand their reluctancy we understand their fear we understand where they're coming from uh, and all of a sudden uh, the vaccine is effective 95% where before the vaccine is effective 50, 60%. And how were they able to obtain that? Even if you tell them it's a different process, even if you tell them, no, that the way they used to do it is different than now, but they are solid on their opinion to which like Imam Yasser Habibullah have stated is gonna require a lot of educating. They're gonna require a lot of talking. It's gonna require a lot of, uh, um, you know, laying out the facts and absolutely. Uh, and uh, some people may have allergic reactions and those people are not to take it. It's just, it depends on who could take it. You know what I mean? And only time could tell really what we could do uh, to convince the people to go ahead and be able to take it. Thank you. Um, Dr. Suhail, we've been talking about vaccinations and mentioning vaccines and vaccination. Would you break down for us as to what vaccines are available and how are they different from each other? Uh, thanks, Lumna, for putting this together. Uh, first of all, disclosures. Uh, I have no financial disclosures with uh, Pfizer or, or Moderna. So whatever I say, you know, it's based on facts. Um, and I have been vaccinated myself. My father has been vaccinated. My family has been vaccinated, those who were, who were eligible for it. Um, so just kind of uh, like you know, piggyback on what uh, Wagma and Dr. Tanvi said. I mean, we think about COVID. Okay, it's a minor cases, but those minor cases you see mostly in the community. We, as a you know cardiologist, or if you talk to Dr. Tanvi, who's infectious disease doctor, once we see patient in the hospital, they don't do really well. I mean, they come with major heart attack. Their hearts are full of clots or major strokes or multi organ failure, and even those that we were talking earlier, those minor cases, so called. One third of those patients in six months, they have underlying psychological mood disorders or they have chronic fatigue and tiredness or shortness of breath. So again, it is not a benign virus. Um, and I would, I would take uh, some mild symptoms or you know, some fever with vaccine anytime or, or actual COVID-19 infection. 
So going back to COVID-19 uh, vaccines, what are available? I'm not going to talk about uh, the vaccine which are available in China or Asia or India. In the U.S., there are three approved vaccines, uh, Pfizer, Moderna, as well as Johnson & Johnson. Um, the Pfizer and Moderna, they, they have the same uh, mode of action. Uh, they use messenger RNA, which is a strand of genetic material that tells our cell to produce a protein called spike protein, which is very specific to a COVID-19 virus. And once that virus is produced, our, our body triggers an immune response. So when the next time if the actual COVID-19 virus comes along, our body will be prepared for it. So that is the Pfizer and the Moderna. Now the third vaccine, which is recently approved is called Johnson & Johnson. It, use, it uses a viral vector. I mean, it also uses a genetic material DNA instead of messenger RNA, but it is incorporated in a modified uh, benign virus. And that virus kind of carries this messenger DNA, sorry, the DNA into our cells and does exactly the same thing as the other vaccine does, which is to produce a spike protein. So basically all three, three vaccines, uh, they help trigger the immunity against the actual COVID-19 uh, virus. And, and all three of them has been found to be very, very effective. And I was just talking to Dr. Tanvir and I, and I asked him, are you seeing the decreasing cases of COVID-19 uh, you know, in, in the hospital? He said, yes. And it's been my experience as well. And it's been experienced throughout the world um, where they have, uh, done a good job in terms of in terms of COVID-19 vaccination. Thank you for breaking that down. And I've been trying to hold on to speaking to Dr. Tanvir because I know once he starts giving us information, it's going to be uh, the most uh, recent, the most advanced and the most hands-on. Um, Dr. Tanvir, what have you experienced with uh, COVID and how uh, we are getting vaccinated and there's this uh, sense of elation of saying we're vaccinated and we can go out. Can you also speak about the efficacy of these uh, vaccinations and the different variants that are coming in? Tell us everything that you know. Thank you so much for uh, having me. So <clears throat> it's been a horrible year. I mean, if you look at the infection, the consequences of infection, and the illness it causes, that is one thing. The psychological effects of that in the families, what I've seen is has been tremendous. You know, it has broken families, um, you know, relationships have shattered because of that. I mean, this is something we don't even talk about. You know, I've had friends and family members who are getting divorced because of the stress related to uh, COVID. One person is going out, working outside in the environment and coming back and family members don't want them in the house. So there's a lot more to just medical illness than, um, than what we actually see in the communities. Having said that, over half a million people have died in the US. And um, we know the mortality is decreasing in the US. And the reason is, as you know, it's been mentioned multiple times, we know the, the, the virus much better now. We know how to manage it better. Now. And that's why the mortality is decreasing. We have you know, a few drugs that are out there that help uh, the severe disease. And you know, there are inpatient treatments, outpatient treatments that are available for them mild to moderate disease, severe disease, that's all there. Now, this is a very interesting virus. All the RNA viruses that we know, they like to make a lot of mistakes when they replicate themselves. They don't make exact copies of themselves. It is the genetic material that they translate uh, every time they replicate that may be slightly different than the parent virus. And that gives this virus the opportunity to mutate, in other words. Many of these mutations that these viruses produce you know, while they're replicating, they're meaningless. They, they really don't make any difference, but some of them, because you know, you're, you're talking about millions of virus particles that are produced in a human body. Some mutations would be very significant, such as we've seen 
in, in cases where we have South African variants, we have uh, European variants, uh, United Kingdom variant, that would, that's what we call, we even have variants that have come out of New York and California. Now, these variants have advantage. They have learned something, how to better replicate themselves in the host. And that is survival of the fittest. And you can apply that to human behaviors as well. If you're not gonna take vaccine, those who do not take vaccine are more likely to get infected with these uh, organisms and they're more likely to die you know, and get sicker, if not die. So with that, what we know is the UK variant and the South African variant is highly transmittable. It's 50% more transmittable than the original virus that came out. Uh, and again, the virus that we got was mostly through uh, Europe. So there's another uh, thing about these uh, variants is not only they are highly transmittable, much more transmissible, but some of these variants are not as well um, defended by our immune system. And so they can cause more severe disease um, and the therapeutics that we have may not work as well. And there's some predictions that um, the antibody therapy that we do for, for, many, for many of these patients, they may not be as effective for these newer variants. So if you look at the virus, the virus has to survive. And if you put barriers after barriers, they're gonna eventually learn how to cross those barriers. And that's what we humans do, right? If we have a flood, we know next time you're gonna put some levees, so we won't have a flood next time. So the viruses do the same thing. When they make mistakes in, in replicating themselves, they would have some mistakes that are going to be beneficial for them. And that's how they will overcome these barriers that we are putting, you know, like monoclonal antibodies that we have, the, um, the vaccinations that we have. But so far, we know all the variants would be if you have been vaccinated, there is, if not 100%, there's some protection. Like we know if you have been getting flu virus every year, and this year you didn't get the flu virus, uh, in, in, in the vaccine, if you didn't get the vaccine this year, you would still have some protection because of the vaccination that you received previously. So even if these mutants are the newer viruses that we are seeing, uh, they're not fully um, protected, uh, or, or if we are not fully protected by these vaccines, but there's still some protection, though reduced, but still good enough protection, that the chances of you dying from the disease are very low, let alone the hospitalization and uh, getting really sick. So, uh, I think the two big variants that we talk about are the South African ones and the uh, UK one. And then there are other potential variants that are on their way. And now we think, at least what I know is the UK variant is the predominant variant now in the US. And that is another example of how nature works, right? So, you know, these viruses are going to get more and more aggressive. So the, the idea of mass immunization is to check the virus, stop the transmission. Because if the only way they can mutate, the only way they can change, the only way that, that they can fight our defenses is by replicating. If we cannot, if, if, they, if you prevent replication of the virus, you will not have resistant viruses. So we have to stop the replication of the virus. And that's where the prevention comes. Like you get the vaccine for sure to protect you from the disease, but also you want to wear masks, wash your hands. Because if, if the virus cannot transmit from one person to the other, it's not gonna replicate to make, uh, to evolve into a virus that is gonna be more resistant to our therapeutics that we have. So not only the vaccine, but also keep wearing masks. Now, 
I tell people in Utah, as of Monday, you know, the mask mandate is going to go away, and you know, but you know, you can you can officially not have to wear a mask, but really do it. It's for you. It's for your family. And I will be wearing masks. I may be the only uh, the infectious disease specialist in the hospital who's wearing a mask because I think those people who are vaccinated, if, if they're going to get infected, what's going to happen is the type of virus that they're going to transmit to the others is going to be, guess what? It's going to be resistant to the, to the antibodies or to, to, to the, it, it'll, it'll, it actually will have the ability to replicate itself in the setting of effective immunization. So that means it's, your vaccination is not going to be as effective. Right? That's the only way you can get an infection if you're vaccinated, right? If you have a virus who's able to replicate in you despite you having been vaccinated. So that is those people who are vaccinated and if they get infected, they're the dangerous people. You have to protect yourself from them because they are the ones who are gonna be shedding the virus that is not going to be controlled by the antibodies produced by these vaccines. So wear a mask, no matter what the government tells you, no matter what the state mandated, and it's the right thing to do. How would you suggest that uh, we uh, kind of manage our, the month of Ramadan is also a high socializing period in our community. We practice our faith communally, and some of the mosques will have probably, uh, you know, uh, added uh, ways for timings for prayers and other things. How would you advise all of us to manage? Uh, obviously, the mosques make their own independent decisions, but as a consumer, as somebody uh, who attends, what would be your advice to the community? I would say, you know, this virus is transmitted through respiratory squishions, right? So I do what I do at home. Don't you know? Go to the bathrooms. At, 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 you know, don't use public bathrooms in the mosques. If you want to do it, do it at home and then go. So you're not, you know, you know, rinsing your mouth and nose and potentially spreading the virus. That is one thing, and that's a common decency to do at this point. Secondly, wear masks. Try to keep that social distance. And I don't know if this is practical and possible or not to sort of upgrade or change the way the air circulation happens in, in, in the mosques. Now the weather is better, so we don't have to have furnaces on to recirculate the hot air, because the hot air, uh, drier air, would actually let this virus travel further. So, uh, so if we don't have our circulation systems going, I think that's a good thing. But you know, we keep the windows open, keep the doors open, so the you know the fresh air is coming in and taking out the air from inside the mosque. Most windows you can open. You know, wear a jacket if you have to, if you feel cold. But I say uh, try to to do those common sense things. If you have better ventilation system, HVAC system that that could be upgraded to HEPA filters or filters that are you know N95 type filters, sure, you do that. But if you can't do that, at least, you know, make sure the people that are in the mask, and, and this is where there, there may be some controversy, but every person who comes into the mask should be vaccinated. And if everybody's vaccinated, then the chances of interpersonal transmission are gonna be reduced. Even if you're vaccinated, wear a mask because you're in a large gathering. And encourage people uh, to get the vaccine before we start our Ramadan prayers. And I would hate to say that, um, you know, at least this message should be conveyed that if you're not vaccinated, you're potentially harming others. And, you know, mosque is a place of peace and we don't harm anybody in the mosque. Anybody who gets, to be in a mosque should be safe. Whether he's your enemy or your friend, that person needs to be safe. And I think the moms can comment on that a little bit better than I could. But how, how do they feel about a person who could potentially harm somebody in the mosque 
and what should we guide, how should we guide them? How should we encourage them to get vaccinated and then come to the mosque? It may be too late for them to be able to fully vaccinate it, um, but we know after first dose of Moderna and Pfizer vaccine, like at least two weeks after that, you develop some immunity. And with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, two weeks after, you know, you have about 50, 60% protection. But after four weeks, the protection rises up to 80 some percent. So if you can get a vaccine, get it. It's not too late. You would still be protecting others within two weeks and protecting yourself as well. I really do understand on this and how um, you know Ramadan, Ramadan is the time where we we need to focus on uh, you know uh, expanding our spirituality. And I would want to uh, speak to the imams, but uh, before I do that, I do want to mention that tomorrow we are running our second dose clinic um, at the refugee center. And we are expecting some Johnson & Johnson vaccinations to be coming in. Uh, we're not sure, so please call us or contact us. Um, after that, on Saturday, we are with the Islamic Center of Kuwait running a vaccine first dose clinic up in Ogden High School. Uh, the information is on our social media. So anybody looking to get vaccinated this weekend, uh, we've been able to create partnership and offer it to our community. And speaking of that, I, uh, I've really tested Lela's pa patience. She is, um, you know, uh, always on the front line uh, being a registered nurse. She once again has taken care of patients who have uh, had COVID and other disease during this time. And I once again wanted to get a sense of, have you seen this disease treat everybody equally? You've also been pivotal in helping us organize these vaccination and education around it. Um, uh, please tell us about how you have seen everything from your angle. Thank you, Muna. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to express uh, my experience. Um, I am a nurse educator, so I have influenced um, patient care through education uh, regarding COVID, regarding protection from COVID. Um, and I've educated our nurses and nursing aides. Um, I, unfortunately, or fortunately, I have not been taking care of patients for 12 hours like our nurses have, because my, uh, my role is a little different. I have been in patient's room and I have been doing uh, specific skills with nurses. So I've seen those patients, I've talked to them, but uh, talking to, uh, to my nurses um, and having them reflect on the last year, <clears throat> I apologize. As Dr. Tanvir said, it has been really difficult year. Um, so these nurses uh, have trauma from all um, the COVID, taking care of COVID patients. Um, just talking to one of the nursing aides recently, uh, she was telling me how she remembers taking care of a patient and providing uh, just a routine hygiene care, and in the middle of that care, patient died. So uh, just a 15 minutes later, she had to collect herself go to another room and act like nothing happened. That is very difficult. That leaves marks on these young young kids that take care of, of serious patients. Um, she wanted to collect herself and be strong uh, so that the next patient doesn't know that the patient uh, next door has died from COVID. Um, she also told me about a patient who had a um, large number, number of children and she missed her children so much. She asked this aide, Charlotte, um, if she can give her a hug because she misses her children hugs. Um, of course, Charlotte did that. She was wearing this special gown and popper and she personally said it didn't even feel like hug, but they hugged for a few minutes and patient was crying. And she said she will never forget those moments. Um, one of our nurses told me that um, the hardest part for her was when she was transferring patient from acute care unit to intensive care. 
because there was nothing else we could have done for that patient on acute care. He was on high flow nasal cannula, maximum of oxygen. So this homeless patient was asking Kylie, tell me, am I going to die? And she was trying to find a balance between uh, giving him some peace and some uh, rationale for transfer to ICU, but not giving him false hope. And just that inability to really help patient is, she's going to carry that with her. Um, for me personally, it was really hard uh, to teach uh, my staff that they can no longer resuscitate patient right away. So um, in normal times, uh, when I see patient who is unresponsive, I would call for help and start compressions because compressions are what really saves patient's life. I can no longer do that. I have to don my popper on, put the special gown on and gloves and then start resuscitating. So we know that compressions are what saves patient's life the most, but we are delaying them because we're trying to protect ourselves. So I hope that the public hears this and understands that coming to hospital uh, with COVID is not a good thing. Um, and there is a way that we can avoid that. Right now, we can avoid that. So this COVID-19, this illness is no longer um, uncontrollable. It's a preventable disease now, but it's only preventable if we do something about it. So as healthcare workers, we are vaccinated. We know how to protect ourselves. But we need, we are asking public to do the same. And I'm really honored to be part of the uh, Utah Muslim Civic League Public Health Committee and have this ability to talk to public and to educate public, our communities, regarding uh, danger of COVID and uh, benefit of vaccine. So what we're doing through UMCL is offering this education or offering actual vaccination to community. Um, we ask you to take the vaccine and protect yourself and protect your families and get back to normal life. We have tools, we have masks, we have hand hygiene, we have sanitizers, soap and water, we have uh, vaccines. So why not avoid? COVID is real. It will stay here if we don't do something about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Honestly, sharing the real uh, experiences that we've uh, that you have seen with COVID, um, and I uh, would ask everyone listening and watching if they have any questions, uh, they can put it in the Q and A section. If you're watching us live, you can put it in the Facebook chat. Um, I'm sure our panelists would love to answer any specific questions. And while I wait for those questions to come in, I do want to open up uh, you know, our discussion around uh, how does one stay safe in Ramadan? Going to a mosque is one part of practicing our faith, but you know, doing gatherings at home uh, for iftar, or other stuff. We've heard Dr. Tanvir call it out very clearly to say, you know, you, one needs to take protection. Um, I want to hear from, uh, you know, I do consider the imams to be as like the frontline workers, right? You're serving the community. And at times you don't have a choice, but to meet them where they are. How do you feel, um, you know, practicing uh, your kind of job at this point, uh, moving into this month of Ramadan? Any one of you can answer. Okay, I can. So first of all, I mean, um, Sister Layla, uh, very powerful, very heart-wrenching, very moving account of what you gave. Uh, I could see more in your eyes that you did not say uh, more so than what you said and expressed. Um, my hats off, of course, and our du'as are tremendously with all of the healthcare workers from the Muslim community. 
Because one of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which is actually the first hadith, before you get an official license in the hadith sciences, you always are taught this hadith anytime you sit in the gathering with scholars. It's called uh, Al-Musalsal bil awaliya which is called the hadith of the mercy, which is called Umar al-Ath radiallahu anhu said, Ar-Rahmanu Ar-Rahmanu, Allah is the most merciful, right? Uh, is the one who will have mercy on the people who have mercy on earth. Irhamu man fil ard, irhamu man fil sama. That you know, have mercy on the people on earth, Allah will have mercy on you. So my true sincere du'as to all of the Muslim frontline workers, mashallah, that you all are representing us there. So may Allah have tremendous mercy on you and your family, keep you protected. One of our challenges as imams is that as a person who has scientific background, I know that, for instance, uh, there's a lot of stuff that Dr. Tanvir said that we agree with 100%. One of the problems we face is that people think that vaccines are an open ticket for taking off the mask, taking off the precautions, and they feel like they're supermen or superwomen, and now they're not going to get infected. And what Dr. Tanvir said was very scary. Because he said that the guy who's vaccinated or the person who's vaccinated and he infects you, you should be pretty scared of that person because he's carrying a variant that you have no idea what that can do. Now, we know from science that there are three types of proteins on the surface of the coronavirus that can mutate. There's the M protein and other, right? And then also we know that there's a therapy right now under testing by Merck Pharmaceuticals and Ridgeback Bio which actually is an oral medication, just like Tamiflu, that disrupts the virus replication and causes errors in that replication. And that it has completed phase two trials, meaning it is underway. So inshallah, we should not leave hope behind. Allah is the one who is most merciful. And we will have a combination of vaccination and a combination of therapies in the marketplace that will help bring down this uh, monster of a disease in control. Now. We heard from Medina Munawwara and the Haram that they have instituted for Taraweeh and Ramadan a vaccine policy. Like if you're not vaccinated, you're not allowed to enter the grand mosques for observing Taraweeh with social distancing and masks. Our problem here in the United States is enforcement. Me as an imam, I can't have, I have no enforcement power. I don't know if Brother Tijar or uh, Imam Yusuf <laughs> have any kind of magic wand that they can just do this and everybody listens to what we say. You know, we are the least heard people and the most prominent people, by the way, just, just, just for the record. The imam is always the, sh the guy in the front of the shotgun. He's the guy who's the public face and he's the least listened to. People don't listen to the imams. And, and if you say, what's the da data for that? We've been talking on Friday pulpits for a very long time. لا ضرر ولا درار. Don't hurt anybody. Like Dr. Tanvir is saying. The mosque. And we, we have said that Allah does not want human sacrifice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Ibrahim alayhi salam, don't sacrifice your son. Sacrifice the goat or the animal. So we don't need to be human sacrifice, sacrificial people. We, we are not believing in this human sacrifice. Stuff. But our problem is our people have this idea. If I'm vaccinated, Take off the mask. There is no need for social distancing. And I can go party just like it was 1999 or whatever. And that's not going to work. So make dua for us. But in the time of Ramadan, I totally agree with Dr. Tanvir. If you're not vaccinated, don't go to the masjid. And even if you're vaccinated and you go, be very careful about how much time you spend there. Because viral loads and the algorithms of how much you're exposed to are all a player in how you get infected. We all know that. Right. So I hope that the Public Health Council of you know, uh, Utah Muslim Civic League can bring a guideline handbook or a poster that that can be given to the masajid based on the expert opinions of the doctors here and the respected medical professionals. Right. That vaccination does not mean that everything is cool now, that you still have to take social precautions. You still have to take uh, in consideration. Am I hurting anybody? And we also know that people who have families like myself, who have young kids, who are not eligible and have nothing as far as a vaccine available for them in the marketplace, 
I'm not going to risk their health, even if they have mild symptoms, right? And expose them to this virus. So may Allah help us and may go out for us. But again, Sister Layla and all of the frontline workers, uh, a lot of prayers for you and your family, a lot of sincere du'as. We thank you on behalf of the community, but your account was very heart-wrenching and very moving, at least to us. I'm pretty sure all the imams feel the same. Thank you. And I, I do really appreciate your idea of a handbook. And I think our uh, health professionals here would be happy to help us create a handbook for the community of how to deal with it. Um, we do, um, before I move on, if anybody has any comments, I do have a question uh, that uh, has been posted to any of the providers here. Are you concerned with the supply delay um, present for those who wanting to get vaccinated? Um, I have friends and family having to wait at least two weeks to get an appointment. So, you know, there are some issues. Uh, just get, get an appointment and, and get the vaccine. Uh, two weeks delay is, is real, uh, especially if you want to get together with your friends and want to feel safe. Um, but again, there's no way around it. You just have to, you know, get the vaccine when it's your turn or when you can get it. Um, so most of these states, especially Utah, is open for everybody now. And I've heard from my patients, um, if there are some problems. They can't go beyond a certain point to be able to schedule vaccine. But keep trying. That's all you can do. Thank you for that. Uh... I thought I had another question. Um, I don't. I do want to ask Imam Yusuf and Imam Tijar if they want to comment on safety during uh, Ramadan and Wagma. I know you deal with a lot of uh, patients um, as to how would you like to advise them to take care of themselves? Um, I guess I can go first. Um, so as far as Ramadan goes, um, something that I advise to my patients is um, essentially you must, they must wear a mask. Um, if they are gathering with um, friends and family members, you know, first I discourage it, especially amongst people that are not vaccinated. And if it's a family that's completely vaccinated, then, you know, the safety of that is, is much, much better. But if they are to get together, if people are to get together, my recommendation is to have windows open, wear masks at all times, sit far away, more than six feet, minimum of six feet away from each other. Um, now that the weather is getting better, maybe like patio iftars or something like that. Again, keeping it to very, very small numbers. And that's only if, you know, I understand just telling people you can't have iftars, it's just not gonna work. Um, especially during Ramadan in our community. And that's the beauty of our religion, right? That's the beauty of Islam is to get together and have that sense of community. And a lot of people definitely missed that last year and they definitely want to get back to it, inshallah, and do it this year. And so, you know, I just encourage uh, wear masks all the time. Um, and, you know, eyewear is actually pretty important too because we have a tendency with our dirty hands to rub our eyes or something like that. So covering eyes is a big must too. And if someone like, like everyone else on the panel said today, if they're going to the mosque, out to the masjids, then to definitely for sure wear a mask and make sure that the masjids are not overpopulated. There's, you know, it's not packed to the brim and there's a uh, good social distancing inside and good circulation and so. Thank you, Wagma. Uh, anybody else would like to comment on Ramadan and staying safe? Just one question to our imams. Uh, again, it's uh, you, you may call it a dumb question, but some of community members may have this. Uh, if you are injecting yourself uh, with a vaccine, uh, would that break your fast or it's okay to do that? You got my question? I, we got sure, the I question. Could. 
اوكي شو قوي امام تجار جو هيك بارك الله فيك I also would like to go ahead and second the beautiful sentiment that Imam Yasser has said to the frontline workers, healthcare workers. May Allah reward you tremendously. We truly appreciate everything that you do. And uh, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect you, save you, you and your family and loved ones. Uh, as for taking the shot or a vaccine, COVID shot during the month of Ramadan or while a person is fasting, Uh, first, we ought to know that uh, uh, from the things that break one's fast is uh, eating and drinking. Due to the ayah, the, the, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that كُلُوا وَشْرَبُوا حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَكُمْ الْخَيْطُ الْأَبْيَضُ مِنَ الْخَيْطُ الْأَسْوَرِ مِنَ الْفَجْرِ Eat and drink until the white thread becomes clear from the back thread of the dawn. So, so, and the scholars have deduced from that that anything that takes the place of eating and drinking takes its ruling as well too. Anything that takes the place of eating and drinking. So IV muscles and stuff like that, that takes the place of eating and drinking. It's a substance, okay? As far as a shot that is in the muscle, as far that it is a nutritional, it's not a nutritional shot, as far that it is something other than Uh, uh, then will give you energy and health like that. Uh, the scholars have said that it is permissible for us to take it and it will not nullify one's or break one's fasting because it does not take the place of eating and drinking. Um, now, however, the other question that follows that is that, okay, I take the shot and we know that, uh, you know, I've taken the shots. I've taken both of them. The first one, soreness in the arm, no big deal. But the second one, And Lona warned me. She said, the second one, you may feel it. And I did. Hmm. And I did. It was for 12 hours. But I did felt it. But in comparison to what I've been hearing uh, and seeing and watching, in comparison to the suffering and the agony and the half a million dying in the U.S. alone, it's minimal and the least that we could do to protect our self-community and loved ones. So, so... Now, when someone is to take it and during the month of Ramadan and he takes it the day before and then the next day he feels it or maybe the same day later on feels it, you know what I mean? Is it permissible for him to break his fast? Um, is it permissible for him to, 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 you know, take something? So the scholars, it is also out of the mercy and generosity and the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to us. If you have difficulty and causing harm to yourself, or there is some, some uh, sickness that you are afflicted with, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed you to break your fast and take the necessary means to go ahead and protect yourself. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told you, then you ought to go ahead and make it up some other time later on. So those things that we ought to go ahead and keep in mind, that uh, uh, yes, uh, you could go ahead and take it during the, while you're fasting, And if you are to go ahead and get sick because of it, and I, my mom took it, did not have a symptom. You know what I mean? Alhamdulillah. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, my, uh, my One of the brothers took it. The first shot uh, did uh, a little bit of reaction, but the second shot was nothing. It just, uh, just like the, the virus itself, the vaccine acts different with different people as well too, which is absolutely bizarre as well too. It is not, there isn't, there isn't a standard of one thing. So, so, so therefore, you know, we just have to go ahead and be cautious about it and cautious about it and make sure that if we take it during the month of Ramadan and we are fasting, alhamdulillah, it does not. But if it caused harm to you and it's causing difficulty for you, it is permissible for you to go ahead and break your fast if it is causing those harms and difficulties and you could make it up later on, inshallah ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Thank you, Imam, for such a detailed and clear guideline. Our bodies, our soul and are important and we need, we are supposed to by our faith, always supposed to take care of it. Um, do we have any other questions? I know I've retained everybody almost 15 minutes over the time. Um, any last words that anybody would like to share? I uh, would like to point also that I made a video recently uh, for the community. It's on our channel. 
uh, with Imam Yasser that talks about all the medical procedures and what their impact is on fasting. Uh, as you, as I agree with Brother Tijar, uh, uh, is that any drug candidate that even has excipients, and this is like technical knowledge that the doctors know, uh, excipients is basically a vehicle that carries the drug. I mean, there is no such drug that will give, be given to you in pure form. It always has fillers and things in it that can the, the body will then you know use as vehicles and carriers, right? So subcutaneous injections, uh, intravenous injections, intramuscular injections, uh, you know these things do not break the fast, uh, and uh, they are okay uh, to take. However, considerations like Brother Tijar said, what if you get the second dose and it's a doozy and you <laughs> you're out for twelve hours? Then in that case. If, if you are that tired, then there's no need to torture yourself. You can break the fast, inshallah, and then make it up later, right? But my, I plead with the community. You're vaccinated or not vaccinated. It's not smart to not use 95 KN or N95 grade or surgical grade masks. It is not wise to think that if the public is vaccinated, I can go and party. It is not wise to say, okay, we only meet two or three families, so they're fine. They're not going to be exposed. Let me have some pakoras and samosas with them at night. It's not fine. That, that is not the way it's done. And, and people have been doing that. I know people have been doing that. Even last year, they've done that. And I, as an imam, know, and I, 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 there, there's no authority. There's no enforcement. And of course, I mean, I'm not going to do like a search and seizure. I mean, we live in a free country. We don't live in a communist country. But the bottom line is the compliance in our community is very, very lax. So may Allah help us all. Thank you. Any of the health practitioners, any last words? So I'd say a few things. You know, we need to protect each other, right? We care about each other. And getting a vaccine means that you care about your community, you care about your family, you care about your loved ones. Wearing a mask means that you care about them. You don't want them to get sick. Have that mindset. Washing your hands means you really love your community, you love your loved ones. And this is, you know, we have many expressions of love, right? We kiss, we hug, we hold each other. And in 2020 and 2021, this is another expression of love that we need to get used to about caring for each other. I'm sorry, I cannot hear you. Sorry, please keep going. Yeah, so I think, you know, this, there are many expressions that we have, and this is one of them. Get vaccinated because you love your family. Wear a mask because you love your family. And show them that you wear a mask. And this is an expression of love. Wash your hands. Take care of each other. You may have saved some lives if you did that. Absolutely. Thank you. I want to thank one of you. I think it is a very rare occurrence where we can bring our three very respected imams, as well as our health professionals together to have this discussion that benefits the community, helps them learn, help them have um, ideas clarified, questions answered. So I really want to thank each one of you um, and also my team that remains invisible in this kind of panels, but there's a lot of work that goes in to put these things together. We will definitely, our public health committee will work on a handout for the masks and the community. We will continue to run clinics and provide education. And if you have any other feedback for us, please know our doors are always open to serve everyone. Thank you very much. Have a good and safe evening and, and Ramadan as well. Thank you. 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 Thank you.